All right. Good morning. Um, you probably morning. all know me, but I'm Paula DiBiase. I'm the secretary and executive director for the Illinois Limousine and Bus Association. This is our first coffee meeting of the year. Uh, just a couple of general announcements before I turn it over to Art. Um, I put everybody on mute, but if you're not talking, uh, please put yourself on mute because we have quite a few people on here and uh, we pick up a lot of background noise. So far we have about 28 people. Uh, and um, we, if, why, if you're speaking, um, not everybody knows each other, uh, but uh, if you wouldn't mind, please introduce yourself, uh, your company and location. If you have questions during any of the presentations or discussions, please uh, go ahead and put them in the chat box and myself and Tracy will be monitoring the chat box for any questions. And that's it. It's back to you, Art. Hey, Thanks for joining us today. This is our first uh, ILLBA um, coffee meeting of the year. Uh, um, as, of, as of last year, probably mid last year, we, we changed our organization to represent um, not only limousine companies, but bus companies simply because the demographics of our association has changed. At this point, um, we're looking to try and attract more bus operators um, in an effort to, to better represent our, our membership and our industry. Uh, we continue to see, receive positive feedback on these meetings that we have, uh, these sessions. Um, they, they work as uh, educational sessions as well as networking opportunities and uh, your help, your assistance, your ideas are very important to us. And as we go forward, we'll continue to try and bring you topics that are um, at, at interest for our industry at this point in time. Um, today's topic is, is safe and secure tips for protecting your business data. Um, we're happy to have Charles Keelan with us today, a technology expert who will provide insights, tips, and ideas to protect your business information, which you hope you, we'll hope everybody will find it um, useful. Um, through the last couple of years, we've had intrusions where companies had ransomware. Um, recently, there was a, a software vendor that um, got hacked, shut down operators. Um, some of this is out of our control. Some of it is directly in our control, but we need to be cognizant of what information is out there and how it's being protected. Uh, after we hear from our speaker, everybody will have uh, some time to, uh, you know, update us on, on, on things that you know or things that you've learned, um, kind of have a little discussion time, and there'll be open topics that we can share ideas and concerns that, that are affecting individual companies and the industry. As a reminder, uh, Paula and Tracy are monitoring um, the chat box. So if you have any questions, concerns, you want me to stop talking, just send them the message. <laughs> I'd like to introduce our board. Um, we have Kaya Armigan with Flash Limousine and Buses. Kaya, you want to turn on your screen and say hi? He's shy. I'm sorry, I'm driving right now. Uh, hi, everyone. Turn on your screen while you're driving. <laughs> Kaya. Hi, oh, Kaya. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Beth Cox with Cox Livery. Everybody knows Paula, Chicago Coachworks. Scott Delheimer with Class Act. Good morning. Uh, Lynn with Galaxy Limousine. Um, Michael with Shriver Insurance. Um, right. You've been very, uh, very active new member, but a very active member. It's very nice to see. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Chris Norlin with Nationwide Bus Sales. Chris has been, you know, a great supporter. Uh, Tracy, uh, formerly with Windy City, she works for me now. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad you didn't tell her that. <laughs> Brian Sheely with Epic. Rumor. <laughs> Brian Sheely with Epic and. And that's our board. I'm glad to see everybody. Thank you for taking the time to come on. And uh, my dog sees that I'm on the phone. Wow, he waited till you got through your presentation this time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
So um, at this point, we're going to turn it over to Charles. I did put his bio uh, in in the uh, chat box, but uh, he. Some of you may already know Charles. He is the president of Summit Seven Seven Agency in Nashville, and he is no stranger to the limo industry. Um, and and as to as I said earlier, the COVID situation has given way to more attacks and scams and. Uh, than ever before. Every day you read something new. And uh, we asked Charles if he could, you know, uh, provide some insights and kind of help us uh, stay as safe as we possibly can. Um, okay, I think I'm, I'm good. Uh, can you send that bio again? Because if you send it before people enter the room, it is not in their chat. That's not, it was in the chat box. Okay, it, I will deal is, with that. It is, yeah, it is not in, it, it, you may have sent it out before I entered the room, but it is not in the chat box. Okay, I'm going. I'm going to. I'm going to. Um, uh, so I just have to make you the host, right, Charles? So you just sign on. Okay. And yes, you send it I, back I believe to me. I accepted the host. Okay, um, thank you. All right, let me see if I can pull this up here. Now I've got four monitors, so give me a second. <laughs> if I connect this up here to the right one. Share screen. I think that's a qualification on being a tech nerd. You have to have more than two two monitors on your desk. <laughs> it makes it easier. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, speaking of COVID, I just got over it. Um, not a fun thing and I'm losing my voice. So I may have to mute it for a second and uh, get some water. So uh, please bear with me on that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, let me see if I can get this to share here. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm in present. All right. Um, again, my name is Charles Kalen, and, and our topic today is going to be talking about different components to virtual security. Um, uh, just to reiterate my background, uh, I do own a company in Nashville called Summit 7 Agency. Uh, I've been in marketing and online security for more than 10 years. I've worked uh, just in the transportation space with close to 200 companies and uh, several hundred more companies beyond that in different uh, industries. Uh, we've, built, we've built anything from websites and graphic design, SEO, paid ads, uh, web hosting, uh, consulting, film photography, and virtual security just over the years. Uh, I, I, don't, I know it doesn't particularly pertain to virtual security, but some of those components uh, will tie into what we do because hackers get in in different ways beyond just uh, ways you think. So. Uh, can you guys see the screen here? Is this popping up for you? And can you hear me? Yes. Good deal. Also along the way, I, I well, chat disappeared. Um, so let me see if I can find that real quick. Chat. Uh, I was going to make sure I answered any questions in case they came up on the fly. Um, where's chat? Bottom of the screen. And, and we're monitoring it too. Got so. it. Okay. I'll, it's, I, I can't see it on here. It just... It, when the screen went full screen here, it took it off. So no worries. Tracy and I will let you know if there's any questions. Perfect. All right. We're going to break everything down into three topics today. And there's three sub points under each one. So nine total to let you know what we're getting into. Hopefully keep this as simple as possible, but give you a broad range of experience that I've had over the last six years that um, I've had with clients. And hopefully we can um, help you, uh, become better informed with what's out there and uh, how to help protect your company. And then also, uh, you know, what can happen if you don't do it? Uh, that's usually where we get calls when people fail to uh, keep up with security or pay attention to it until it's too late and then it's really bad. So we'll go over a couple of those examples. Uh, I will admit any of the company names out of there for privacy purposes, obviously, um, but we'll go through this. So we'll touch on website security, hosting and server specifically, and also email and password security. And then we'll do the Q&A. Uh, again, if you have any questions, speak up or post it in the chat, and I'll be more than happy to stop and answer those questions. <clears throat> um, one of the biggest things that we find uh, an issue with, and uh, most of you, I assume, have websites. It'd be smart to have one, um, is the SSL. Uh, a lot of people don't pay attention to it. They either don't have one, don't think they need it. Uh, they forget to auto-renew it. Uh, just things happen, and either it gets turned off uh, or they don't have it. So... Uh, one of the things that that's probably the first thing we always check with clients is making sure their site is secure. Uh, there's a lot of things that can happen if it's not. If you don't have an SSL or it's expired, you will get penalized. 
organically through Google, which owns 70% of all search traffic. So you can also get penalized through Bing or other search engines as well. Uh, so you definitely want to make sure that uh, you, you make sure that the healthier um, SSL is in a good place. And I pulled up a link here. Let me see if this will take us out of the full screen for a second. Um, does anyone, can I get a, a web URL for somebody in here? I don't care who it is. Can someone just give me their web URL and I'll use them as an example? Midwesttransit.com. Spell that right? Uh, yep. yep. Way, to, way to take one for the team. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we go. So SSLshopper.com is a free resource and it's probably one of the best SSL tools. And again, I think you guys will get a copy of these slides. So don't feel like you have to take all these notes. Yeah. Um, and I believe this is also being recorded, but you can see here, for instance, that what you want is green check marks all the way down. Um, you obviously do have an issue here. I don't know if you knew this. <clears throat> this is why we check it every once in a while. Um, so you may want to get this looked at when you get off the call here. Uh, anybody can put their domain in here, including subdomains. So if you had a reservation subdomain, so, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, book.midwesttransit.com or whatever it may be, you can also run those because you have to have independent SSLs on those as well. And this will tell you the health and the position of your SSL. So it also tells you um, how long until it expires. Uh, one of the little tips we always say is, you know, if it's not already set to auto renew, and even if it is, uh, about 100 days out, go ahead and just put on your Google calendar or whatever you have, put a sticky note on your laptop, desktop, whatever, and make sure that you get that renewed well ahead of time so it doesn't expire. Cause then you have to renew the license and it can take a while to propagate and you get penalized for the whole time while it's not up and it just causes a whole lot of trouble. <clears throat> so um, I'm not sure who spoke and gave us this, but I would check that. Um, going back here, um, another thing with SSLs uh, well, actually, I'll, uh, I'll touch on that when we get to the bottom here. Um, do, you, do you guys know if you, most of y'all may have a WordPress site? Are y'all, is that the case for y'all? It seemed like most of the sites we built were on WordPress. Um, one of the biggest things we find is that people do not update their themes and plugins. And we'll touch on this in greater detail when we get to the server part of this and the hosting, but that is mega important. Um, is there, is there a utility to automatically update the themes and the plugins, or is that something you have to go in? Because I know, I know I get email updates from WordPress that you're now, you know, WordPress has been updated to 15.7.4, you know, or what, whatever the numbers are. Yeah, no, there is. There's different tools you can get. Um, there's some plugins that will help you automatically update it. There's, uh, I believe this is free. There's GoDaddy Pro, I believe is what they call it now. And um, that is not the link I was looking for, sorry. Um, but you can sign up for Pro and what it will do, especially if you have multiple sites, it'll allow you to connect your site uh, to GoDaddy Pro and maybe it's up here. One caveat while you're doing that, Charles, this is Marin, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, definitely you can have it set to automatic updates and most solid reputable website hosts will have that feature but a lot of the themes and plugins need to be manually updated. You can turn in auto update, turn on auto updates for a lot of them, but a word of caution. Um, sometimes WordPress will come up with a core update or um, themes will, will not be in, in line with the latest update or compatible release and you'll, you'll automatically push that update out and it'll break your site. So you wanna just make sure that you're paying attention to it. If you just have everything set to auto enable you do run the risk of something breaking and you, it'll be harder for you to determine what it was if everything is turned to um, essentially be auto updated. You'll have to reverse engineer it and one by one turn things off to see what it was that caused the problem. Yeah, good point. And even if you do that, doesn't even if you find the plugin, doesn't mean you can be able to fix it easily. Which, Correct. Marin, I'll go into, that's a really good point. I'm going to bring that up when we go into uh, the backups and security section here in a second because that's that's definitely one of the biggest things that can happen. I actually, do, personally, I don't have it set up to automatic update just for that very reason. I know Mary and I've talked about this in the past on calls. I, I don't, I don't do it. I actually wait uh, about a week uh, when updates come out and that's on purpose. So whenever you have your website, you have your WordPress uh, core framework as your base. Then you have your theme on top of that. Uh, a lot of times you'll have a, a child theme on top of that. And then you have your plugins. 
So if something below the plugins isn't correct or work correctly with a new plugin, even a new plugin gets updated without the forward correction, you know, updated. It can, it can break in the reverse cycle as well. Um, so that's why I wait. Uh, and then also having backups so you can restore something, you know, a day, a day before you did the backups or did the updates, you know, to get you back where you were. So that way you're, you're not stuck with a site that's messed up or even completely down. Uh, but again, we'll touch on that here in a second, but good point, Marin. Um, <clears throat> let me see here. Uh, but yeah, again, themes and plugins, uh, I would, if you just, a lot of people just forget about them. Again, go put it as like a weekly update on your calendar, or if you have somebody who's helping you manage your site, uh, even a company, just make sure they're doing it. Um, sometimes, you know, people who are managing can, you know, not pay attention to that or, or, or just, you know, forget to go in there. Just again, that's, that's a priority to make sure it's updated. We're using Wix and um, we're not using WordPress. Um, we get notifications from the, I forget who we use themes from, I think Maurice, and they send us a notification in advance of it being updated. So we are able to just stay on top of it. Absolutely. And that's what Mary was talking about. Some of those hosting providers automatically do it or, or they take care of all that. And WordPress, it's, there's a lot more manual components to it. <clears throat> and again, I, I don't personally update even WordPress the second it comes out because it can break the theme or you know, that's why I wait on the plugins. I just I make sure everything's compatible as much as possible before I update it. Um, That's really good advice, Charles. I usually do the same thing, especially with the core. You just don't know um, if you're not running the latest version of PHP, something that could just be really minor. Um, if you're not fully compatible with it, you could take down your site pretty quickly. That's me, Ballard. Join the meeting. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about real quick is form submission in relation to email addresses. Um, let me pull this up here. So I'm going to give you an example. This is our site. So we have forms built in across the site. Uh, one of the things, and Marion, you can touch on this as well if you want to chime in, but one of these kind of awkward things I've seen over the years is that this is our form and this is our web address, summit7agency.com. If the email that's on the back of this form whenever someone goes to submit it, if it is like an at Gmail or at Yahoo or different email address other than the domain, it can get flagged at times, especially if you don't have an SSL in place, depending on your plugin or what form, you know, form field you're using, uh, it can flag the field. So just make sure that whatever uh, email address you have on the back of your form submission is yours. And another thing for security purposes, I actually go in and check it every once in a while, because in case your site does get hacked, if I'm hacking you, if I was a hacker, I can't tell you how many times we've seen this. They will actually go and add their own email address or a third party email to your contact form. So they literally get a copy on everything that comes through. Yep, and that's yep. one way they get your information. So just, you know, make sure you check that as well for security purposes. Um, all right, we're gonna move quickly here. Hosting and service security. Uh, touching on what Marin said, um, I know a lot of people aren't fans of GoDaddy. I've, uh, I've used a lot of different hosting um, platforms uh, we probably you probably have used GoDaddy the most um, if you don't have a security uh, software or third-party service that's monitoring your site or your web applications I would extremely highly advise it to you uh, it will help detect if there's changes made to code or people are adding scripts or just something that looks malicious that's what the systems are set up for uh, I see a lot of times that people just don't pay attention to this. They don't want to spend the $80 a year or whatever it may cost. Uh, and they, uh, they, they suffer a lot whenever it happens. I mean, it's just, it's really bad. Um, give an example. Uh, we had a site uh, not too long ago. They got hacked. They, we got called to come help them. Uh, they got in through a plugin and one simple script added over 4,000, uh, over 4,000 uh, scripts to the site. So even if we got one, two, five, 10, 20 out, we, there was thousands more. So the security software is really great because it, it uh, once you put it on there, it detected where they came from, we were able to find out how they got in next time. And it also, uh, through GoDaddy, for instance, uh, they bought a company called Security a few years ago, and it is awesome. Uh, they are able to help clean that out in a matter of less than an hour in most cases and get you back where you were. Uh, but there's a lot of services out there that will help you. So if you are using... Uh, a third-party company to help manage your site or you're doing it on your own or you have your friend does your web development, just make sure you have some type of website security uh, on there to help monitor and track the site at all times. Uh, a lot of the sites that we manage, 
Uh, there's hundreds of hack attempts or attempts a day by robots or people trying to get in through login forms uh, to get in these sites. So you really want security software in the back here because it'll really help give you peace of mind and, and help you whenever uh, something bad happens. Uh, speaking of something bad does happen or you mess up by uh, trying to update a plugin, the theme, the framework, or whatever type of site you have, having backup is is beyond essential. Uh, for GoDaddy, it's like $2 a month and it's, it's very cheap. Uh, for $2 a month, we get daily backups, we get weekly backups and monthly backups. And GoDaddy, for instance, will keep a 90 day backup that you can pay for. It's not cheap and it takes like three days to back that one up. But if you do get hacked or you do screw something up with your site, if you're trying to manage it on your own or your web developer does or whoever it is, uh, you can actually go back and quickly restore your site so you're not down uh, and going through the process of trying to figure out what happened. Uh, so backup is, is key, not just for um, helping you get the site back up, but also uh, if, if you do get hacked, say you got hacked 18 days ago, you can go back to 22 days ago and click a button and restore your site. And then all their scripts will be out. And then you know you can try and patch the hole where they got in. So uh, if you don't have something, uh, just make sure it's in place. It, it's, it's beyond worth the money. So uh, there are a lot of other hosts that provide that as well as for, that it's free and it's included in hosting, including DreamHost and SiteGround. I believe Bluehost also provides it. So you can look at, depending on what plan you're on, you can probably get those backups readily available included with your hosting if you, if you end up not going through GoDaddy. Absolutely. And I'm just using GoDaddy because it's just one we know right. really well. Right. Uh, Marin, you're a big DreamHost, DreamHost fan under that. So that's uh, <laughs> absolutely, I don't, I've used it a couple of times. So they're all different and they all have different, uh, you know, advantages for using them. Um, so good point, Marin. Um, so I want to tell you a quick story real quick about why your ICANN and your register, registrar information is very important. Uh, I'm going to pull up GoDaddy here. I think I'm already logged in. Uh, let me see here. edit. So uh, let's see, I'm trying to find the One second, please. I don't know what page it's on here. Your domain. If you are asking somebody else to manage your domain, or you're doing it yourself, one of the biggest things that you can do is make sure it's in your name. Yeah. Um, I, I know it sounds kind of simple, but I can't tell you how many times, and Marin probably can agree with this, you get access to a new client site or you're, you're looking up the information. One of the, one of the uh, operating procedures we have when we're going through with a new client, even just to check it every once in a while with existing clients, is making sure that the information is under the business name. Uh, my dad is an orthopedic surgeon in Nashville. He has six clinics, and about 15 years ago, he's been practicing for almost 40 years, uh, 15 years ago, he hired a company out of Brentwood, Tennessee. Uh, he asked them to manage to make sure the domain stayed renewed, uh, that his phone number he had forever that everybody knew uh, and really catchy, you know, numbers to it that everyone could just easily remember for marketing and his fax number. He said, can you just make sure the stuff stays renewed every year? They said, sure. And so they took it over and they changed all the contact information. Uh, I believe there's four different points of information. I don't know why. Um, Usually you can get to all of them here, or maybe it's on another page, but there's usually four different points where you register the information for your domain, four different points. And they had changed all four. And uh, they started overcharging him. And he's like, why am I paying 10 times the amount this year that I did last year? And they said, well, that's just what it costs. He said, all you're doing is renewing the information. And dad said, I'm going to leave your company. They said, sure, no problem. Uh, we've been helping you switch. He said, great. Well, here's a new company, switch it over. And they said, sure. Give us $100,000 and we'll give you all three of them back. <laughs> and dad said, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not giving you $100,000, switch it over. And they said, no, so you can sue us. And he did, and he lost. Uh, all because they had switched over the information. Possession is 99% of the law in this, in this world in a lot of cases. So if you let somebody else host that information, maybe it's a former business partner, maybe someone you got, you got fired, uh, maybe an old business owner you bought the business from, I mean, make sure you go in there and check this information to make sure it's registered to your name. Um, I'll give you another easy way you can do this. If you go to, um, I don't have this in the slides, but whois.com forward slash who is, you can, this may be under privacy, but you can type in a domain name. And yeah, in this case it's private, but the point is, um, yeah, here we go. You can see it. 
you have your domain information, your register information, your contact information, your administrative and your technical. That's all the four different contact points. You see they're all the same fields. You gotta make sure all of them are on your name just in case something happens or you know, whatever it may be, you wanna make sure you have full control over that. In this case, privacy is turned on so you, you know, we can't see everything, which is on purpose. But um, again, if it's one thing I look for with people, if they don't have privacy turned on, I can easily see who owns it and drive to their house or the business because their address is listed. But just make sure it's in your name because otherwise you just want to make sure it's in your control. Yeah, it can, it can be very hard, hard to change this stuff over because I know when I first opened my company in 09, um, it was actually a friend of mine um, who had a company in India that built our site and did all this and no issue. It, it, they were totally ready to turn over the domain <laughs> and stuff to us. We had more trouble with the host than we did with anyone because they wanted a lot of proof that it was okay and um, put us through the ringer. So something that should have only taken a couple of days ended up taking several weeks as we went back and forth with them. They wanted proof that the, uh, the uh, domain owner was willing to turn it over to us and all this. So uh, when, when any new members come on and they're setting up sites, it's the first thing I tell them is you need to own, the domain name needs to be owned by you, uh, period. And I think it's still very, very valid advice, especially if you, even if you want to just change your host, you have, everything has to be, you know, in your name. So. Absolutely. No, that's a good point. There's the thing, bad things can happen. And if you are building a new site and you have a new domain, just again, make sure your subdomains, just make sure everything is in your possession. Be, be aggressive with that and, and uh, do not compromise on that whatsoever. Yeah. Um, Going back to uh, your hosting and, and servers, uh, Google Analytics is something really, really useful to have to, to monitor your web traffic. And, and that's, all, that's very valuable information. But one thing I would tell people to do, and a lot of people don't have this, is Google Search Console. So if Google detects that you're hacked or they find anything malicious on your site, uh, this is one of the places that they're going to alert you to tell you. If you don't have Google Search Console, they really don't have a way to notify you and you're just going to get penalized until you figure out why, you know, you're, you're dropping in rankings or, um, you know, what's going on with your site. Why is it not showing up? Well, uh, you know, again, this is another way to make sure that, um, you know, you're, you're basically checking on the, uh, you're basically maintaining the security of your site. Uh, and also the, the search position as well. You want to protect that because these days, like you guys were talking about when we hopped on the call, any dollar you can get or generate, you want to make sure you can get it. And, and if, Google's going to help you make sure you don't drop in your rankings for malicious content or whatever it may be. Um, they do a pretty good job. And once it's set up, it automatically alerts you and it's free. So it just takes a little bit to set it up. You connect it up through your hosting uh, and you're good to go. And I always just set up Google Analytics form as well if they don't have that set up. I just do them both at the same time. So uh, if you have someone helping you, make sure it's set up. Um, and again, it's free and it's super valuable. Uh, going on here, what we find a lot of times is that um, one of the ways that people get insights is you give out your admin or some type of administrative password that has access to some level of your systems to your employees, your business partners, uh, your wife, your spouse, your best friend, whatever, you know, someone logs in one time, you give it to them. And if anyone was tracking what they were doing, they have key logging software on that device, um, however they got access to it. Uh, it, it can wreak havoc because, you know, they can be server passwords and they get into your entire server. And if you have multiple sites in there, they can get into all your sites. Uh, potentially, uh, you want to be very careful who has access to what information. <coughs> uh, for instance, I've got 12 people that work for me. I have one other person that has full access to everything and I trust him basically my life. So um, I'll give you one bad example of this. I gave one of my developers full access who I trusted. Uh, and there was 22 websites on a, um, and this actually retains the backups as well, why it's important to make sure they're actually activated. Uh, I gave one of my developers access to go mess with one of the sites. We had 22 sites on the server. I had backup set up on it. It was confirmed by Bluehost at the time, and it was confirmed and set up by tier two support, not even basic support. And I was getting emails that everything was being backed up. The developer went in there and he accidentally deleted what we call an FTP account, a file transfer protocol account, and it deleted 22 websites in about 18 seconds, along with their databases, all the files, everything. And I thought, okay, no problem. I just, um, I'll just go ahead and, and get the backups restored. So I called him up and I was like, glad I had the backups. 
God told us, I'm sorry we set it up. You've been paying for it. You've been notified that you do have your backups. And unfortunately, because he had access and he did that, um, all the sites are gone. We had to build 22 sites off searching through Google to find the copies of them uh, manually. We had to build 22 sites in uh, 15 days. Uh, and that was an absolutely miserable two weeks. So lesson learned there. Um, one way you can help manage the passwords. I know you guys have a lot of passwords. Uh, I know you don't like long and complicated passwords. There's a lot of options out there, but we use lastpass.com for our company. And it, I can manage thousands of passwords. I have, if my house burned down right now, I could grab this computer, get my dog's kids and wife out of this house, and I've got access to everything. Um, even if I don't get my computer, it's all stored locally on my phone. It's all secure. Um, and I can use really complicated passwords. Uh, I'll give you an example here. If I were to, I'll show you how this works real quick and how easy it is. Once LastPass is set up, which is the website, I put the link on the slides. If I want to log into any site, once I have LastPass installed on my computer, you see these little gray boxes here? It automatically populates from that copy and I just check it and it automatically fills out anywhere I go. Any hosting for a client, it's all secure. Uh, I can have, I don't know what the maximum is for you know, uh, password characters, but I can have 400 password characters, I don't even know what it is, and I can easily store and track everything. And if I'm gonna share this password with somebody who I'm gonna give access to, I, I can actually share it from, in, from inside the LastPass system to where I don't have to actually give them the, the information. I don't send it via phone, I don't send it via email. Um, and that's another thing too. Once people get these passwords, however you send it out, you send it through an email. I, I don't know, Mary, I don't know how you do this, but I never, I don't care how frustrated someone is. I never send a pass, a username and a password together in the same uh, device. I'll text them the password and email the username. I, I never connect them up because if someone gets into your email, your computer, your Microsoft Word doc, you quote store everything. So it should be secure on it they literally get access to everything. So LastPass is where I store it all. And I try not to keep any passwords for anything on the computer itself, just in case they were to get in. And that protects our clients and, and us as well. Uh, but that's really a great option for people. And the other thing is people will use the same password over and over and over because it's easy to remember. But the problem is if you get, if someone gets access to it, then they can go try your other accounts with the same password and username. And a lot of times they can get in. It happens all the time. So make sure you have different passwords. I know it's frustrating, but LastPass or another service, uh, I don't know if you use a different one, Marin. Uh, it really helps keep your, your, your system secure, especially um, if you have other people that have access to your admin credentials, uh, be mean about it. Uh, make sure they're changing their password every 90 days. Put a, put a calendar reminder uh, to, to make sure they're changing it, confirm it with them, uh, and make sure you monitor who has access to it. We use I use LastPass for myself. My, and so our whole family does just for the same reason of you need to have really complex passwords um, and people can, people can easily hack into it. People who use even simple passwords or they think, oh no, like where they have, you know, or they perceivingly um, perceived to be strong passwords. If, it, if it's something that can easily be cracked by a, a password cracker, you know, it's, it's better to use really long, complex, crazy passwords and store everything in LastPass and just use one central one that you can remember. So. Absolutely. The other thing, uh, the other thing I want to bring up here is be very careful what you click on with your emails. I know you guys get a lot of emails. I've got six different email accounts that I manage. I do not click on any link that I get unless I absolutely know who it is. Um, it's so easy to mask a link and take you to a malicious site. Um, it's just so easy. Uh, for instance, if you want to go to, I'll give you an example. If take PayPal, because you know PayPal does get hacked. Um, if I want to rebuild this PayPal login page, I can go download, which I already have on my computer. I have a program called Site Sucker. I can literally just type this URL in. It will copy all the files for CSS design everything and I can relaunch this page under summit seven agency dash login site so information.com or whatever I want to put it on and you go to that link thinking your look it looks the same all the logos everything you log in I you don't even know it now I've got your password and username to get in that's just one of the many ways they can get in but if you click on links you've got to make you you've got to know where it's coming from because that that's how you can download scripts to your computer you can 
give them access to things you, you're not intending to. People just don't pay attention to that. And it's easy to fall into that trap. Uh, one other piece of advice, um, I use an iPhone, so it's pretty secure. Uh, if you have an Android phone, uh, the app stores are a little less lenient or, or a little less trending on what kind of apps they let, they let into the stores. You gotta be very careful how people get into your, your devices. Uh, do you guys remember the uh, flashlight app a couple mm -hmm. years ago? And it came out that Russian um, app developers had put that in place and were accessing your information the whole time while you were trying to get light, looking for, you know, getting your house and the whole time <laughs> they had access to everything. I mean, it, you just gotta be very careful, um, even the apps you download. But one of the one piece of advice is on the computer, uh, any any personal device, whether it be your company or any of your employees, especially everyone working at home now, uh, we try to make everybody not only download but constantly update some malware um, software on computers. I actually have two sets of malware software on this computer that I do deep scans on, just in case someone's on my computer. If they have a key logging software, which actually like if I'm typing in something here, the second I type in anything, it's it's logging it and sending it to them. It's then they just, anything you type, anything personal, any of your searches, any passwords, any private information, they, they get copied on everything. And it's an easy way for them to gain access to your systems. Uh, so make sure you, yourself and anyone on your team is scanning their computers to make sure that they're clean as much as possible, because uh, that's another big way they get in. Well, uh, you know, what's interesting is, um, I think I passed this on to members like a few months ago. There was a series, that, the government gets a lot of spoofing and hacks a lot or, you know, or people trying to steal their email addresses. And there was a series of emails going around for the IRS, but it didn't say .gov after it. So we just reminded everybody, look, you know, if you get an email and it says the IRS is looking for your social security number, but it does the, where it came from does not say, you know, .gov, then it's not them. Because the other problem is sometimes they just change a letter or two in a particular address. So you'll look at it really quick and think it's yours. Oh, I know that person. And it turns out it's not. He, you know, changed the name a little bit. Or Paula, they'll use a name and you, if you, if they'll use a plain name and what you'll see in your email client. And then if you look at the actual address behind it, it's not tied to in any way, shape or form. That person. The look and feel of the email or what have you. Charles, can you answer a question like what happens if someone did click on a link and what do they do? Like what's the first thing they should do if they clicked on a link and it ended up being tied to malware and malicious, you know, uh, unleashes something. What, what's the first thing they should do? If it's on your computer, go scan it. I mean, that's the second I click on a link and I've done it before to where it looks fishy. I, I just go and scan my computer immediately. Um, I just try and log out of whatever I'm in just until I get final word back on this is clean or not. Um, that's one of the best things I have found. If you have anything to add to that, have at it. But I mean, I, I the second, second I find I've done something stupid, I, even accidentally, it, it's it's go go clean your computer, go scan it and, and scan it. Uh, do do a deep scan. Don't do the soft scan to where it's like, oh, I don't have, I can't wait 15 minutes. I can wait three. You know, you do the soft scan versus the deep scan to get to all the files. You just Do you don't have any know. recommended software you would re you would suggest that people utilize? Um, yeah, give me a second here. I mean, I have Norton on mine, and I have Malware Bytes, but yeah, I, I have Malware. Yeah, I've got two, um, which I think are very good options. I use Bitdefender, and so I can actually get one plan here. And uh, so I get a plan for five devices for the year. It's like a hundred bucks. And I put my wife's phone, my wife's Windows computer, my phone, my computer, tablet. I'm mean, at as many devices as I want. Oh, uh, now. And whenever our kids get old enough, we have a two and a five-year-old. When they get old enough to use devices, I'm putting all their devices on it too. Because I don't know what they're letting into the home network that people can get into to look at stuff. Uh, you know, again, they get in in so many different ways. It's you really can't necessarily keep them out if they really, really want in. Um, the other thing is on your phone, do you guys ever get like those UPS links, FedEx links, where it's like, oh, your package has arrived. Click here to view and track. Don't click. I, I, every single time, I know not to, I still almost click the dang thing because I'm like, how can this not be real? Uh, you know, again, if it's, there's a lot of ways they can get into your phones, your devices, your tablets, computers. Um, but Marin, Bitdefender is the one I use um, is the primary one. So 
And they actually do a good job. They actually update the virus database every single day from around the world. So they take all the viruses they found all over the world. It's a company based out of Canada. And they actually put the repository and update it daily. So anything that's new, they actually add it for the deep scan, if that makes sense. So it's, it's super useful. Because um, if you get hacked, I mean, just seeing how much it costs you to get your identity back. It can cost you thousands of dollars. It can cost you a lot more than that. It can cost you, you know, 100 hours of time or whatever it may take to, to get it corrected. I mean, 100 bucks for to, to keep yourself as clean as possible usually can thwart a lot of that stuff. Also, Bitdefender also offers something free. Uh, Marion, I don't know if uh, Norton has this, but I can enter all the email addresses for myself, my wife, and anything I'm tied to, even my uh, employees. And what it does is it scans the internet and anyone gets hacked, like if Target gets hacked, and one of my emails is listed on that account. It alerts me to say, hey, Target was hacked. You know, the corporate server was hacked for Target. You have an account with them. Go change your password immediately. So it's a really great thing to track other, other platforms that are getting hacked that you would never even know to keep up with or that you had an account there. And uh, if your email shows up on that hack list, you know, it'll alert you as well. So but we have LifeLock um, as, a, as a third layer of protection for my, both my husband and I. He was um, fell victim to like, uh, an unemployment scam, like unemployment insurance scam. Um, he, his employer was hacked, not him, but his employer was hacked. And so we ended up having to have like, cause they had his social security number and everything have full tracking for, for our, our whole family, including the kids for their social security numbers. But what that does do, and a lot of these programs, to your point, Charles, will do this. You can enter in your, your cell phone number, your house number, your kids numbers, your email addresses, and it's gonna to look to see if it shows up anywhere on the dark web. So yes. you'll know right away, okay, I need to go change passwords. And it will tell you usually where the leak occurred. So you'll know, okay, there was a breach at this site where you shopped or there was a breach here or there. And then you can go ahead and lock your, your own, like um, your credit files. You can do a lot of different things to protect yourself. You don't necessarily wanna change your phone number, or your email addresses, but you can alert your providers and change all of your passwords everywhere that will just kind of reset everything for you so that you know okay they have that they have that information but they can't use it against you basically yeah that's a great point uh, one other thing is that's a it's really it's a really interesting point is um i try and keep my files locked on my computer just in case someone did get in and start snooping around um so because i'm on this thing all the time so it, one thing if you have private documents like for instance I keep all of our social security cards, our passports, medical documents, American Red Cross, I mean, health records, uh, everything I scan into LastPass. There's a document section to it. Uh, and, and you can actually put anything from your contracts or, or if you, again, like if someone hacks into your computer, like Marion said, her husband's company was hacked and then she was impacted. You know, you guys are responsible for all your employees' documents. Where do you have those stored? Are you on your computer? If someone gets in, they get them. Once they download, they have them. Then you ha then it's your responsibility to alert your empl your employees. And it takes up time. They're going to hate you. Um, you know they're going to live in fear. Um, so get those locked up. Put them in some type of virtual environment to where they're not physically on your desktop. Uh, again, I use LastPass to lock up all those documents and I delete them <laughs> off the computer so that way they're always stored and they're secure. Um, that's another great thing that I have found that people um, uh, that can happen. Um, anyway, with that said, there's a lot of information we just went through and I don't want to, I don't want to overwhelm you guys too much here. Uh, but at this point, if you guys have any questions, um, more than happy to, to try and answer those at this time. Okay. Send me this send me the access back and I'll uh, okay. see if there's any questions. Sure. Give me a second. No worries. Well, I would have my employees. I've always instructed my employees if they see something weird going on. The first thing they should do is unplug their Ethernet cord. Is that does that actually matter? It just connects them from the server, is what it does. As long as they don't have Wi-Fi, you know. I mean, like I've got hard connection and Wi-Fi to this computer, so even if I unplug one, but if that's the only internet source, and then, then yeah, that would help. Uh, that's a definitely a great immediate option. But again, you still have to get them off, and it's always better to prevent them and be able to track them if they do get on there. But uh, that's that's a good point. Yeah, just unplug whatever you can immediately. Um, yeah, I have to unplug, unplug, and then do a security scan. Yep, I think that'll. That's a smart choice. I, I think you need to. Uh, you need to come out all the way because I can't. Uh, I've got. Yeah, I'm trying to get this back to you. 
Okay, please. Sorry about that. No, you're good. I'm trying to. How do I share it back? I think you right, guys, this sounds like a security breach to me. <laughs> I know. Everyone I unplug your machines. Just kidding. Don't yeah. do that. Uh, Carl, <laughs> I think if you click on participants and you see Paula's name, you can just say make host. Yeah, that's it. Just make me the host. I, I accidentally did it that way. I should have just shared the screen with you. <laughs> oh, here it is. Found it. Thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> this is me provide like managed services. So if there was somebody here who was thinking, you know, I don't have an IT company that I work with. Does your company provide this service where you could be an outsourced IT department? We do. We actually manage it for a lot of clients. Um, and again, it's just something they don't, they don't want to deal with or don't have time for, or they don't know what they're doing with it. Um, yeah, we, we do manage that for uh, quite a few different companies. Um, just you know, it's our job to make sure that all those points that we just talked about that, you know, it's our job to make sure everything from the SSL to your domains, your hosting, your security, your backups, um, you know, even if you don't, you're not even sure that everything's in place, uh, you know, just let us know. We'll just at least come in there and help you make sure you're set up correctly. So uh, did, I, did I do that right? Did I, did I give you back the host? Yes. Perfect. So this is Lynn with MCI. As I've been listening to this great presentation, my HR department sent me a test fish email and I clicked on the link. So now I have to go through training. Oh. HR. Oh my God. Liz. So, um, is that something that we can provide for all companies, like some kind of HR test phishing email? And we could say, oops, you did bad. Yeah, no, a lot of, a lot of companies are doing that now. Um, you know, they're, they're basically just trying to make people aware of it. And it's definitely something that can be done. And it's smart to do it. Um, where I'm actually about to do it with our team, so don't tell them. Um, yeah, it's uh, well, yeah, we, even though I'd probably be guilty, but I love that idea. <laughs> no, it is a good idea. I always send them to like a really bad, like uh, a hack screen gif, like the, the Russian hackers. Uh, like it makes <laughs> well, it they really got hacked, but it's just a fake page, uh, just to scare the dead. Mine out. was an HR memo hey, our PTO schedule is changing, click here to see how it affects you. Ooh. That's a good one. I just had a client, um, gosh, not even a month and a half ago, and I was telling Charles and Carla about this one in email. Um, she received an email that looked completely legitimate. It was from a woman claiming to be a photographer and said, the photos on your website um, were, that you were using a photo on our on the website that's copyright infringed. Okay. Um, click here on this, on my Dropbox and um, remove these images immediately or I'm filing suit and Antoinette Gonzalez joined the meeting and uh turns out she clicked on the link and it unleashed malware the the perpetrators took control of her computer okay. and demanded it was like ransomware basically <laughs> money back for, uh, in exchange for her to you know to give her file, to give her file. <laughs> she immediately shut down she had an IT department or an IT resource that she used it's just like Charles's company and they fortunately, like he was saying earlier about backups, had full backups of everything she had so she didn't have to pay the ransomware. They brought her computer over, cleaned everything up, did everything like that, rebuilt everything, and then restored her backup from 24 hours prior and she was fine. But without that, she would have been a city nut. And, and I looked at the email that she received and I probably would have clicked on it because I would have been like, wait a minute, I know all those files and the pictures on the website are fine. But you have that little moment of, wait, of, I mean, it looked exactly like a photographer would have sent a copyright infringement notice. The only difference is, is uh, it, was, it was malware. Again, anything that says download or access something, like that should be a red flag in a lot of cases, yeah. unless you know. Um, a test that I would use is, again, that, that's a really good one they sent to your HR department, from your HR department. That's sneaky stuff there. Uh, <laughs> but like i always i always try and say oh i understand just in case it's legitimate uh can you please give me a call and i give my google voice number in case they you know i don't give my cell phone or anything personal if i'm questioning it and then if they don't call then i know you know a lot of cases or don't try and write me back uh, the other thing is if you open up a link um you guys can see this but if you hover over a link a lot of times it will show you like in the corner here 
you can see where it's going to be pointing. So, you know, I can mask this to say, click here to view our company schedule or the changes, but behind it, I can send you to a porn site. I can send you to wherever I want to send you and you don't even know it until it's too late. So you, you, like the text uh, or a button can be hiding a malicious script. But the other thing is that a lot of times what they'll do is they'll make the link look legit, but then when you click on the link, it'll actually redirect you once you get to the link. So you wouldn't know it in the first place. So it's better just to question everything um, and get confirmation, um, you know, about it. And that, that's really helpful. Charles, is there a website people could go to to look to see if um, an email they got that might look suspicious is uh, a common or known phishing scam? Like a place where people could go just to see, okay, is, is this something that's known or being tracked? Yeah, like if I was questioning this link right here, this is obviously not going to be a good example. Um, Maybe this one. If this was a link that was sent over, I'll usually copy out the address and just, and I will not actually go to it. I'll search for it. So I'll take off like the ending so it doesn't actually go to a site. Um, you know, again, I'll kind of mess it up to where it's going to find most of it and then I'll search for it. And then a lot of times it'll be flagged elsewhere. But again, if it's something that it's like, a, you know, it's not, it's not common to keep switching up the links. I mean, this may not work for you. But again, I just don't trust people when it comes to what they send, um, you know, and I'm going to download or access, I, it's either pre-verified or I verify after it gets sent. I never click on stuff. Uh, it's just not worth the risk if anything happens. I'd rather take the extra two minutes and call wait for a response or ask me mad at me for not clicking on it. Um, yeah, I just search for part of the text. And, and again, right, just right click on the link, copy link address and post it in. Don't hit submit and just, you can read the address if it looks weird. If it's a, you know, it's a Russian link or, you know, wherever it may be coming from, just, um, you know, break up part of the text in your search. So, you know, that way it's not going to a website and then it'll bring up search. So in this case, it didn't actually pull the site, but I got search results. You know, I, I have a situation with my phone. I have my corporate email on the phone and which has my username and password. Um, and I'm an administrator um, on our servers, and it's the same username and password. And if you use, use my username and password on the servers, you're kind of in. Um, so if somebody were to hack my phone and they went to my email and they were able to get my username and password, they could actually get into my servers. Yeah, they'd strike the mother load, that's for sure. Right? Uh -huh. See, look, I'm going to give you guys Typically, a, if I had a bad site, I'd do it on my phone rather than a computer. So this is just, this is one of our servers we made, right? This is our internal server. Remember, we can't see your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. All right. So if you, want, if you want me to do that, I'll just uh, share it if you want. Hang on a second. Do I just... Well, just, if they get in, I just want to quickly show you guys how bad it gets very quickly. Because if you have multiple, okay. uh, let me see here. Can you see the screen or am I allowed to? I, I did give you access, but it's, it's acting kind of weird. You got to pick what screen you want to mirror. Oh, there he there is. You okay. Thank can you all see this? Yep. Yes. Don't hack us, please. Um, so I can find <laughs> it. Um, but if you like, these are all, this is all like a dev server. So if they got into any one of the sites, right? If they got into any one of these sites, which are all security on them, so I guess you want to try and get in, have fun, and have at it, and we'll see how fast we catch you. But you know, again, all it takes is like here is um, where is so here's an example of a website. If they get in through a plugin, all it takes is one plugin. If they get access to any of this, let's say through Rev slider, which is one that gets hacked a lot. They now get access and, and if they if they hack in a certain way, they can get access to literally every single one of these sites and then they inject all your sites. Mm -hmm. Then you're in trouble. Um, Cause then you have to go through each one and verify it. And then, you know, a lot of the information is stored, right? That those were those website files and here are the databases once this pops up. So you can see they can even get in the databases as well once they get root access to something or admin access. I mean, it just would not be a good day. So 
I guess uh, I know what that's going to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> so just make sure you you verify this stuff is taken care of because again you you can do all you, you know, <laughs> doing everything you can to get business right now. This thing can derail you very quickly if this stuff isn't focused on. But once it's done, it doesn't take that long to go through and check this stuff off. You just have everything automated. Uh, then it's kind of peace of mind and you're really protecting yourself. Um, you know, with team, I've, seen, I've seen companies get hacked and then they steal so much information, they get sued and, and sometimes people lose losing a part of their company over it. You know, clients don't trust them at that point. Because then, then you're required to notify everybody involved that you got hacked. I mean, legally you have to. Uh, yeah. so it's a mess so it's better to have all this stuff checked out and uh, I, I, yeah a little bit of a different subject I, I don't know how many of our members are actually have like shopping carts or e-commerce stuff set up on their sites because some of them don't have uh, a reservation system so they're not con connected to their credit card processing that way we have a site for a different company that we run and we grabbed a link to the uh the, the credit card processors uh, processing so that when a, when a, someone came in and registered for the program, they would be able to just pay automatically. Um, it would, you know, we had, you know, a certificate that's everything set up and the, the code was, we thought was secure. And one night someone came in, they made a copy of it and ran 4,000 credit cards through our processor. Um, overnight and we couldn't stop it because once they once the hackers got a copy of it they could continue to run the stolen. so what they would do is they would run stolen credit cards through it so it ran for eight hours to my horror and the developers um even though we immediately pulled it off the site so once something is stolen it's almost impossible to deal with you know i mean the ramifications are just so huge luckily for us most of the credit cards were stolen so they didn't process any money on them but a few did and uh it's uh it's kind of a it's i know some of you are using other programs other than like you know you're not on limo anywhere or you know any other software so be really mindful if you do put a link for processing uh credit cards because it, it's they're not very secure at least not in our experience anyway here let me i want to share one more thing here let me share uh, so watch the reason why people were able to get into, can you guys see the screen again here? Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna open up a form. So if someone's trying to hack your site, you can right click, go to view page source. All right, so this right here is the form. Now in this case, we're using a plugin called Contact Form 7. We're not really taking any important information, but I can't tell you, and, and Mary can probably you know, other stories to this. There are some people who literally take credit cards through forms that are not written through JavaScript or externally. So JavaScript is ported into the site. It makes it harder for them to get it. Uh, but if you are using like a form plugin or something and you're taking personal information, all you got to do is write a script or it's already written. All you do is get the script inside the site and anything you fill out in the form fields here will just be copied over. They don't even have to even have the email address in the back end of the form. That's how a lot of times they're, they're capturing the information your clients are submitting. So just make sure that whatever you're using for your forms, you know, it's not using a JavaScript or it is using some type of JavaScript. Some it's porting into another server, uh, preferably that's collecting information. That way the responsibility is also on the other provider uh, as well. That way it's not all on you. Cause if, if you get hacked and they've been stealing information this whole time, uh, we had a client in California this happened to, they were stealing it for months. And they had to notify everybody. So um, just got to be very careful with that. And on that note, I'm going to stop here and turn it over. There was a question. Let me go see if it's still there. Uh, um, we have one of our, one of our uh, attendees is asking if there's an online security training course that anyone would recommend uh, that you could use to train employees. Marion, you got some on this? Let me get some thoughts to that. I don't know of anything off the top of my head, but there's probably through like an eight, I would think through an HR site of some sort or like mm -hmm. something along those lines. They probably offer basic internet security practices. Um, 
let me let me give some let me actually also i can also send out an email after the fact to or send it to paula um after my husband's company was breached they had a whole slew of things that they had to do um employees that have to go through training so there might be something that i can get from him that his company had um all of the employees do as well or things like that so i can look most of the things that i hear typically though it's more of um making sure you actually have an IT company and that you're doing all of these things to begin with. I think that that's something that I think is really important. And I know a lot of small businesses don't even have a dedicated IT firm that they work with, whether or not they have somebody on staff. I think it's, you, you definitely need to have a firm like Charles is to, that you can call if there's a problem or at least make sure that everything you have is shored up and that you don't have any vulnerabilities to begin with is the best way to prevent the attack. Is to prevent the attack. We have a we have a document and it's it's probably a ten page document that goes through employee training um, how to protect their server how to protect the computer um, what to do um, how to not get hacked and that's something that was actually required by a contract that that we got they wanted our employees to have security to to help secure their data that would be on our servers and uh, as it turns out. You know, this this application, talking to my insurance agent and talking to our attorneys is something that will actually help us in the event of a breach that we do have policies and procedures in place. That's smart. There's I posted a link. I don't know if this would be valuable, but I just typed in security awareness training or whatever it was. Uh, Udemy has a course for like 15 bucks. Um, just as uh, you know, I guess stuff you can pass on your employees. Another option is, um, if it's something you guys want or would be useful. Uh, we we don't do this on the regular, but we train our team. I mean, I do all that stuff with our team internally. Uh, what may be helpful is either find another company, or if you want our help or, or Marin's help or whoever, you can probably get on like a security call and just put everyone on one call at one time and get them to check basic things on their computers all at one time so maybe once a year everything's refreshed and their training's refreshed um that way you're not even relying just on training that may be again i just i don't play around we actually make uh, all of our employees we use uh going back to uh, here uh can you guys see the screen yes all right so we use something called the defender box we find it uh, I don't know where they moved. We use something called BitDefender Box, and anyone who has admin access to anything, we make them put it on their server. It was and the top it, option in that drop down. Oh, was it? Yeah, there was a big I probably missed it. purple mark next to on the right side of it. So if you go back to that screen, when you do four home BitDefender products, first well, thing. I literally wrote, 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 wrote that link. So we use this, and this is also another way that we actually block out a lot of the ways people can get in our home network. So that way, in case anybody, ha we actually have a guest network too. And actually I run two networks here at the house. So that way, again, I'm just a little paranoid, but you know, this is also another thing you can put in your business. You can put inside your, um, you know, on your server in the company. Uh, it's a really, really great option. And I believe you're going to get what I talked about earlier, being able to monitor your devices. I can't, I don't know how many devices you get to monitor with this, but anything connected to that, um, that's connected to that server with this box, I believe you can put it on a, on, on a limited amount of devices off to track on there. It's, it's really cheap. Um, so again, it's another option to protect you internally as well within, you know, if you have a, you work from home, you'd have to have them for each location, or if you have a, an on-site setup like this runs everything through it and it also alerts you if anything's coming in or people are trying to get in the network it alerts you on your phone um, and you can actually block people out from the app too you can actually block out if someone's ip address is getting tagged for something you can say don't let this ip address use the network until we figure this out you can block them so it's a really great little tool um, we've used it for years and it's awesome <clears throat> I think I just shared a document that, that we use that is compiled from a bunch of different sites um, and I'm using it internally. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know if it's useful or not for you guys, but it's there. Called the Security of Security Awareness. Thank you, all right. I'm downloading it right now. Well, that was a test. Congratulations. You have just downloaded some uh, malware to your computer. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to be all over your shit now. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> making my eyes water. All right, um, I'm, I'm going to suggest we wrap this up in about five minutes because we have a few more updates to do and all. Um, or 10 minutes, whatever you think we need. <clears throat> yeah, any final questions and you guys can get back yeah, to I think you. we got most of the questions. Um, I'll open it up one more time. If you have any questions, you can just ask them or put them in the chat. And if anything comes up, uh, I put, I'll send over these slides if you want to review them. Uh, if you, anything comes up, my email um, is also in there. Just feel free to email us and we'll go back to you for free and just help you guys out to make sure you're all taken care of. I have, thank you so much, Charles. This was great. Um, a lot of good information. Thank you, Marin, for always pinch hitting and keeping us straight and okay. on the straight and narrow as well. Um, I think you know, sometimes that we really have challenges um, because we have a, an organization with different levels of experience you know, as far as um, somebody built my website and they kind of lose control of it and things like that. But this is becoming such a more such a prevalent issue these days. Uh, there's just some simple things that hopefully everyone took away and can, if they have someone that's doing their website or managing their or hosting for them, they can get to them and uh, hopefully get some benefit out of it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you and um, we'll let you back to your meeting. All right, you can, that would be good. Let's see, okay, so that's it. All right, I guess I, I'm back in control. Oh, I'm always out of control, but that's okay. All right, so um, if there are no more questions, I'm gonna move on to the rest of our agenda. We just have a few updates uh, for everyone about what's going on in Chicago and heaven knows where else. Um, for our Chicago folks, uh, just a reminder that you should be uh, sending your chauffeur license and livery renewals by email. The, that is the best way to deal with the city of Chicago right now. So we've sent instructions out before and I'm gonna send them out again. Um, and uh, if you had not seen the decision from the last city council meeting, um, licenses for chauffeur and, and livery that expired between March and now will be considered current until July 31st. Uh, I know a number of people already went ahead and uh, renewed their livery license. That's totally fine. But you do have the option of waiting. But I will add to that, um, if you wait on your livery, you may get a letter and have and, uh, from finance like I did on Saturday that said that my finance account was suspended for not renewing with a $250 fine. Don't get scared. <laughs> it is a normal, I guess it's a normal letter that comes out when you don't renew on time. Uh, so I did confirm that with the city. I will be putting that out as an update because I thought it was, I thought it was pretty bad because I had already notified them that I was going to, to renew later. And then I got this letter with a fine. So that's definitely a uh, uh, just a, a something to be aware of. Um, also, if you haven't, if you're not renewing yet, make sure you check your renewal packages for any inspections. The inspections are not included in the uh, grace period for July. So if you have an inspection coming up like we do, and you miss it, it's a three hundred and fifty dollar fine. So. Um, you should have all your renewal date, all your inspection dates are uh, on the back page of your renewal packet. Okay. Um, we hate for anyone to miss any of those. Okay. Um, a, uh, aviation. So for most of you, you know, there's already, uh, if you're using O'Hare regularly, you know, there's a new configuration for accessing the arrival terminals that went into effect on January 4th. Um, 
I believe uh, they are going to start enforcing anyone who tries to use the commercial road. So I would encourage you uh, to follow the instructions we sent out. If you didn't see the instructions that we sent out um, that Beth and I worked on and took pictures and all that, uh, let me know and uh, you can put it in the chat box. We'll send you a copy. Um, there, um, we've also been talking to O'Hare about providing a staging area for motor coaches as we do not have one. Uh, they are going to look at some real estate options and get back to us. If it turns out to be a meeting and you're one of our motor coach folks and you'd like to be involved, just send me a message. Uh, my, my guess is we will get some options first for staging and, and there may be a meeting probably in March or something like that. But that's uh, one of the issues that we have been trying to work with the O'Hare particularly for, for a while. And uh, we figure it's a good opportunity now that it's a little bit quieter over there and uh, to, to try to um, get that particular issue resolved for those, for those folks who are staging at O'Hare in buses. Uh, the state of Illinois announced their BIG grant was uh, finished being distributed on Friday. That was the, uh, we had the largest amount of grant funds in the country distributed, which was 275 million. And congratulations to any of our members who were able to obtain a grant. Um, uh, quite a few were. Uh, that is it for the grant. Uh, as far as we know, I have been getting questions over the last few days. Will there be another one? Will there be around three? We have no idea. Um, that was, that money had to be spent by year end and it was. So uh, at this point, my suggestion to anyone, even to our out of state people, you should be looking at your county and state uh, websites to, to see, check on any potential announcements for funding grants and that kind of thing. Um, we will we'll post what we find um, as quickly as we find it. But right now, uh, the main focus is the EIDL and the PPP reopening and folks should be looking at that. Um, and I, I, I will add that I think with the current uh, people that are gonna be taking over uh, the Congress, the House, or the Congress, the Senate, and the White House, that it will be fairly easy to get some new funds pushed through, especially geared towards the hospitality industry. Yeah, it could very well be. But again, uh, for the time being, um, you know, we're just, the most important thing is to just keep, you know, reading stuff and keeping on track with the, with the various sites and, um, and like I said, we, we will let you know when we find out things as well. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that are members that uh, uh, we did waive dues for ILLBA for 2020. If you paid in 2020, um, um, we will carry it over to 2021. Um, the January renewals, you should expect your invoices by the end of the month. Um, uh, we have a number of payment plans, including uh, monthly deductions by credit card, uh, split payments, all kinds of stuff. So if you're interested, uh, give us a shout. Um, if you're not a member, please consider joining our association. We also welcome uh, members outside of Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. We have a number of associate members as well. Uh, we'd be more than happy to have you. Um, and uh, you can leave me a message in the text and I will send you an application. And I, I'm still waiting for a few of you to return your application. So um, I'll be reaching out to you as well. Um, we also have uh, an, an independent operator membership program, which for our, for our um, members, you will see an announcement tomorrow reminding you that you can uh, sponsor any of your one car operators to receive a $50 per year dues. So the details will, uh, will be distributed tomorrow on that. And lastly, um, the next coffee meeting will be on February 16th, which is a Tuesday. I'm not 100% sure of the topic yet, but I believe it's going to be on the latest uh, uh, interpretation of, of uh, classification of workers. And we'll get, we'll get some more detail on that as soon as we uh, firm it up. Um, we're working on that right now. And as always, if you have any topics that you would be interested in, um, that would be wonderful. Send us anything that you'd like to hear about. We will get whatever speakers we can. 
um, to join us. And that's all I have to say. And I did it in less than 10 minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So Paula. this is the time when we open it up to everyone. If you have questions or you want to talk about something that's concerning you or um, what's on your mind. And Tracy and I will, Tracy will take herself off of mute and then we will uh, answer any questions you have. Oh, she wants me to ask her to unmute. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Tracy. No, and I just want to thank Charles and Marin. I mean, that was excellent information. I took quite a few notes um, and am guilty of several of the points that have been made. <laughs> Very guilty. I have something that everybody should hear. What? Go ahead, Mike. Mike. I, Tracy, I didn't interrupt you, did I? No, go back. No, no, go ahead. Uh, just about a week ago, we switched from Verizon to T-Mobile with our three phones and our two iPads. And we did it here locally in Shorewood. And I asked the guy to help me set up some of my parts on my phone. And a day later, I found out that they were using my information for a scam. And the only place we went were two places. One was the restaurant, who so we know the owner, and there was only one waitress, and I watched her run the credit card. And then the other one was the T-Mobile store, where they had access to my credit card, and obviously that's where it's at. I'm not going to name names or anything, but I turned it into the fraud department. I just think everyone should be aware of the fact that we're talking about scams and fraud, that mm -hmm. you never know where you're at, and you never know. Who. It wasn't a large amount of money. It was only 107 I had coming on the Apple. They took it. That's all I have. Yeah, that's extremely frustrating. It is frustrating. I mean, the IOA had their, they had, we had our debit card uh, stolen a few months ago. And the first thing Tracy said, was it in your wallet? Yes. We hadn't used it in about six months, but it still got hacked. So unfortunate. You know, one thing that just to kind of dovetail off of that, if you're not doing it already, I know Chase Bank does it and a lot of the banks, I would set up every security alert they have you have the opportunity to put on, you know, if someone uses your card and it's more than $50 or whatever, there's a variety of them. It's a bit annoying. They'll go to text message, but what it does is if you haven't made a purchase, I mean, if you've made a purchase, it'll pop up if you, and then you can uh, determine if there's an issue. Um, that is one of the things that uh, is really helpful these days. So, okay. Anybody else with questions? Yeah, I'm well, kind of. I was, was going to say, the with, room. I'm just the, trying to see how many other uh, Chicago operators we have on here. Uh -huh. um, but we've been talking as a board the last week or two weeks uh, regarding rideshare and the current landscape of rideshare within the city. And being on the NLA board, um, there's quite a bit of chit chat in other cities right now and their approach with rideshare. Um, and then Art, I know you've been wanting to talk about independent operators and the new classification for, for independent operators. Um, I just don't know if we have enough Chicago operators on this call right now, just to kind of get a pulse where everyone, how everyone feels at the current time. Is this something that we should be, uh, you know, talking to the city of Chicago at this point in time? Are there certain issues that we should be raising um, as an association? And Art, if you have anything to add to that, um, but I think it is time in the next 30 days to get a pulse from our members. So we have, we have a few members on here. I don't see it at this point is, is a city of Chicago uh, situation. What's happened is AB5 was turned over and went for referendum and voted on in California. And Uber and Lyft and, and the ride share and, and, and uh, gig economy came up with a model that um, is somewhere between an employee and a independent contractor. I think the term they're using is independent employee where they cover insurance, workers comp, guarantee minimum wage, 
And that person can then operate legally, not as an employee, not as a independent contractor, but something in between. And it went through in California. And what's happening, what's been happening since then is the, the gig economy has been hiring attorneys and, and lobbyists to run out to all these different states and try and get, get laws on the books in those states that would allow this classification somewhere between an employee and an independent contractor. Um, and it was interesting that that was happening, but what's even more interesting is very recently, the uh, Federal Department of Labor um, came out with a new guidance for how to determine whether somebody is a independent contractor or an employee. Um, so there's something happening on that front, exactly what it is, I don't know, but there's a move in that area. And I think it's something that can sneak in behind us that underneath us, whatever, that um, may provide a way, I'm employee based, may provide a way for us to legally operate um, as an independent contractor or have people that are independent contractors, you know, not have the worry anymore of, of, of needing to um, have employees. Um, I don't know. I, that my, I think that's something I've been following and I, I'd be interested in getting more information on it. I think, I think that because, because it's such a hot topic, um, we we're considering bringing somebody or having a panel discussion next month, because I think some folks really need a little more education on it. Um, when you read some of the modifications to what they did in California, um, you, it, it still has a test to prove that someone is a contractor or not. And, um, but we wouldn't, still wouldn't pass that test either. So for some folks, it's just, uh, plus the fact that we constantly have um, challenges because of folks inability or concern about carrying workers comp for their contractors or making sure they cover it, um, there's a big exposure. So um, while this is all brewing, it's a, like Art said, it's a very good possibility that some something might may start getting the interest of our state, you know, our state government and be better to be ahead of it. So I see we have Vesson, Markel, Travis, uh, Mike, Scott, um, do any of you have any feedback or thoughts at this point? But you have to take yourself off of mute if you want to talk. Well, were you asking me a question, Paula? No, I'm just asking in general. Oh, know? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's important, you know, um, just making sure that we continue to educate, you know, when we're having our meetings with the city of Chicago, continuing to educate them on the laws of workman's comp and that it is, it's a state law and that they should be enforcing it and that they shouldn't enforce it for taxi and not ride share. Um, you know, so I, I just think we need to kind of stay focused on that aspect of it, um, but then watch what other cities are doing so that we can use that as an ex as examples when the city is coming to us looking for our feedback. Yep. All right. Any other questions or thoughts or comments today? Do we have any feedback uh, regarding the changes at O'Hare and um, the recent uh, going down to pick up and the different lots and what have you? Is there any feedback on that? I, I was, I was going to comment about something that Mike said as far as credit cards being hacked and whatnot. Uh -huh. There are algorithms out there that will constantly run to see if a credit card number exists. So regardless of whether or not you have used a credit card, I have actually had credit cards that I've never used that have had fraudulent charges because algorithms of these scammers sit there and just try and try and try and try. And it's like winning the lottery. Um, every now and then you get one that, that is processed. So definitely make sure that you get notifications when things are purchased. Um, I know that I was turned on to a company called Divi, D-I-V-V-Y, where you can create virtual cards and turn them on and off very easily through uh, a web portal or through an app on your phone. 
that would not allow fraudulent card or fraudulent transactions to get through. And you can sit there and create a card for each different vendor. So like Windy City could have a, a, its own card that they would charge. Um, sure, uh, Paula, you would have one. Arthur, you would all have one. So I, I have a bunch of different cards that I use for different vendors that are turned on and off as needed to prevent any fraud that goes through. So that's interesting. What we've done, and that's interesting, it's called Divi. Yeah, Divi. If you go to uh, getdivi.co, so G E T D I V V Y.co. You want to put it in um, the text box too when you get yeah. on? Okay. So, what I've been doing with American Express is I've been setting spend limits on each card. So, we have a card that's being used for affiliates. And, and if, if we called and says, okay, we're going to process. Ten thousand dollars. At that point, um, we'd open the card up for ten grand. You process it, and then the card would be maxed out again until I opened it up for more. Yeah. Um, that's, now, this, this this you can set individual budgets for each card, individual spending limits. You can create you know individual cards for each one of your staff members and turn them on and off. So if they're doing a motor coach run going out of town. They can use their card and you can turn it on for them to charge their, their hotel or if there's, you know, a tire that needs to be repaired, you know, you can up the limit for them to be able to, you know, pay for the tire repair so on. And so on. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Anybody, um, that's what, they answered the question that Tracy asked about the airport. Um, I only got one. Well, I got one comment yesterday, but so far we haven't heard anything coming to the office, and I know Beth hasn't either. Um, just uh, one person told me that they went down the commercial road yesterday and they got yelled at, and I said, well, that's because you weren't supposed to go down there. So uh, other than they have not been, they've only been issuing warnings for the last week or two. But make no mistake, if people don't follow the follow the, the, the road and go and go through the uh, the, ta the taxi lot and process there, um, they will start and those because the commercial roads are going to be remaining open because they need those for the buses and other deliveries. So um, if you are found going down, it, they are going to start ticketing very shortly if they haven't already this week. So. Um, but so far, we haven't had any concerns. We actually did, Beth and I um, requested a test run of, a, of stretches to make sure they could get in there because we had some concerns about the uh, ability of stretch levels to pick up the, the cards from the machine and everything went fine. And Beth was worried about the, the three lanes and was there enough room for stretch. So that's, and so, since then, we've had a few people go down there and uh, again, no, no complaints. So, but if anyone has anything or they run into a problem, just send us a message to the ILA office and well, ILLBA office and we'll follow up. That's it. I think we're done. Oh. Good to see everyone. Here we are, mid January 2021. I know. Happy New Year. Believe. Who, who knew we'd make it this far? <laughs> <laughs> who said we are? Oh, wait, no, just kidding. Oh, my God. I just really do appreciate everybody's time. Um, I know there's so many meetings and workshops and um, everything, um, you know, and, and we really appreciate you all coming and joining us. It's, uh, it's really great to have you. And if you have any suggestions for speakers or somebody you'd like to hear from, or you know, definitely let me know, let Tracy know. Um, or even just the topic, you don't have to have a speaker, but just the topic, we'll find the speakers, we'll find people that are Absolutely. knowledgeable about the topic, but uh, just send the ideas for topics. Yep. Awesome. All right. I think we should wrap it up. Are you okay with that? I think we're good. All Nobody right. Nobody has questions, concerns, we're good. Thank you, everyone. Peace out. Uh, Thank you. Great meeting. Thank you. 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 Thank you.